I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 6th of April, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today I am recording from my office where I have the windows open because it's a beautiful day and I didn't realize until it was too late that it is 100 degrees outside. And so I am melting. I have no air conditioning and because I'm recording and I've been on the phone much of the day with a headset on, I couldn't have my fan on, which I keep just out of sight there. And so very, very warm here. It has been a bit unbearable. Today we're going to be talking about festival season here in the country, Semana Santa that starts, and we got a number of viewer questions that we're going to tackle right after the bump. So today we're going to be talking about festivals here in Nicaragua because this is a huge part of life. And today, Thursday, is the start of the real festivals for Semana Santa. That is the Holy Week or basically the week leading up to Easter, which happens this Sunday, both here and in most of my audience's world, such as the United States, Canada, and most of Western Europe. Uh, so that is uh, coming up. This entire week is going to be super busy as we prepare for uh, Semana Santa. And tonight, being Thursday, is the day that most people have managed to get out of work, don't have to work tomorrow, or are just going to be tired for work tomorrow. And um, you go out and do things. Tonight, specifically in our area, is the procession of the uh, silenced Jesus, or something like that, uh, which starts at the Iglesia Sutiava, which is the big, I believe, cathedral here in Sutiava in this part of the country. And uh, that is, it has a beautiful square that I always say is a very uh, European square. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I love downtown Sutiava. And uh, this is a very traditional festival. And this is why I wanted to talk about this. What you get a lot here in Nicaragua, and it'll vary uh, somewhat based on what kind of festival you're going to and where and how big and everything. But by and large, there is this kind of Nicaraguan, and I'm sure lots of Latin America does the same, uh, festival style that you go to. So you can expect to find this on a regular basis, uh, probably at least once a month or so, all over the country. So you could be up in the mountains, you could be down south in Rivas, you could be here in Leon, you could be in Managua, and these things are going to recur over and over again in some mild variation where you could go and hang out. So here in Sutiava, what we have, uh, this festival is not the largest, but it's pretty good. They set up on the main square a bunch of attractions, like, like the things you get in small town uh, back in the 1980s and 90s in the United States. You got your tilt-a-whirls and your swing things and your trampolines and that kind of stuff. Small attractions you're able to move around pretty easily with small trucks. And then you get a lot of food carts, whether they're actual food carts or food trucks or whatever, you get those things. Uh, and, and they come in and they so pizza, hamburgers, hot dogs, fried chicken, and a lot of other staple Nicaraguan food. Simple stuff that you can do in food trucks, uh, quesadillas, tacos, you get Mexican food, uh, and they'll line up. And then the church will have a festival with a procession, bands, um, some church services, and a bunch of stuff like that going on. So there's a number of things to do. Plus there could be a parade, uh, there could be special events in the park, like it depends. But these are kind of the basics. And so beautiful night, we went out uh, and went to Sutiava, walked around, got some food for Marcella's kids who wanted to go. My kids didn't want to go, so I tagged along with them so I could film the event and bring it to you guys. Got a lot of hits on my shorts for showing the food. It's really cool getting to see these events because I love the street food, but it makes me very sad because I'm vegetarian and nearly all the good see, uh, street food is meat. Um, I did not get a chance to get pizza just because we didn't have a lot of time. It took so long to get the food for the kids, but that's fine, not a problem. But I, d I was hoping to get some more stuff to show you guys and, and only got a little bit. But uh, Valentina got a hot dog, which is this huge presentation. Like it was an easy 15 minutes of watching them do this whole process of making hot dogs. And Tafari got uh, fried chicken with French fries. And it's just this, you know, fry station where they're frying all this stuff. It's like a little mini Kentucky Fried Chicken thing out on the street. And uh, both meals were under $2, like $1.80, $1.90 kind of range. Lots of food, very unhealthy, of course. Uh, but both of them, you know, you can tell from looking at it, this is really high quality, delicious, unhealthy street food, really greasy. It was great. I got to see a show them making a hamburger. And the way they do hamburgers here in Leon is a full-size burger is a beef patty, a pork patty, or bacon, depending 
plus bunches of grilled chicken all put on a single enormous hamburger. They are so big, it's hard to describe how big these are. You would never believe that they make food this big in Leon. It is absolutely crazy, but so cool doing the street food stuff. I hope that I get a chance to get out and get a lot more street food for you guys. And I want to know, get down in the comments, what do you think about videoing street food and going out to that kind of stuff? Like, is this stuff that you really want to see? I like this. It's hard to go out and do uh, nighttime filming, but to make that better, I did just place an order. Uh, Kim is coming down in a couple weeks. She's bringing stuff from the United States, uh, and I've got a couple key things. Someone's just, my, my media mod is broken. My replacement's been ordered. Uh, two more Enduro. I currently have one Enduro battery for this GoPro 11. I got two more coming. And then the light kit for the GoPro, which is tiny, but it actually produces like 150 lumens or something. Rechargeable, goes right on the media kit, and produces enough light that it should make a lot of nighttime filming actually plausible. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's going to work, that I'm going to be able to show more food, do more like festival stuff, be able to vlog in different conditions. I got to have to play around with it. It's, it's a first piece of experimenting with portable light uh, because quite often I need more time of day to record things. And uh, if I can find a way to do that with a GoPro, it'll be, there'll be just a lot more than I'm able to bring you. Uh, so that was our activity tonight. So we went out and did that and had uh, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I like being able to uh, do those kinds of things and, um, you know, get to be a part of the community because so much of the community goes out and participates in this. This is not like in the U.S. where you just get a few people to go to these things. This is a ton of people in any given community go out to these festivals because it is the activity to do. And remember, we talked about how in Latin America, especially in Nicaragua, people go out all the time that's what they do. When these festivals come about, which is like once a month, everybody goes. Your neighbors, your friends, your family, everybody's there. It is the place to be. Everyone's out to be seen. Tons of people are just sitting around. Lots of people getting drinks and get beer, having food, riding the rides. It's very, very popular. And the church is packed and everybody watches the procession and tons of people are in the bands watching that. It's a really cool activity. If you're going to be in Nicaragua, I recommend taking, if you see one of these going on, take the time to go and check it out because it's really, really cool. Okay, so now we're going to get to some of our viewer questions. Jerry Goble, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry, uh, had a number of questions for me. So I'm just going to go through these since she has hit them all in order and has like pretty decent questions. So let's start with this first one. Love the vibe here. Can you tell me the differences you've seen between the two coasts, meaning the Pacific and the Caribbean coast here in Nicaragua? Did you ever consider settling on the East Coast, Caribbean? Did you uh, think there are any good options over there? I'm more used to that ocean. Not sure what it's like in Nicaragua, though. All right, Jerry. So the first thing I want to say is really think of this. It's not Atlantic like the mid, like like Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Maine, Nova Scotia, right? Or even Florida. This is very much the real Caribbean. So we're talking about really shallow water, very warm, very, very calm, right? This is the same water that is short shared with southern Cuba, northern Colombia, northern Venezuela, the interior of the Antilles, that zone, Jamaica, that stuff. Um, so this is a beautiful, beautiful body of water, uh, absolutely excellent options as far as, as the body of water goes. Um, and uh, so that's the first piece, right? It's not... It, it is the Atlantic Ocean, right, by maritime law. That is, uh, the, the Caribbean is considered part of the Atlantic. That's, that's how those bodies of water work. But it is not like you're on the Atlantic, whereas on the Pacific side, uh, it's the Pacific. You are on the Pacific with surf and stuff. So if you want to be on the ocean, you're going to have that ocean feel uh, on the Pacific side. And you're going to have that Caribbean chill thing on the Caribbean side. So we don't really think of it as two oceans. It is, but we think of it as Caribbean versus uh, Pacific Ocean. So that's the first piece. The second piece is culture. Nicaragua as the cultural zone, right? I'm not trying to make any particular political statements here, simply that traditionally in the old days, the place known as Nicaragua that is inhabited by the Nicaraguans, that is part of the, uh, the, the, the cultural group, the linguistic group in the area is Western Nicaragua near the Pacific coast. So if you were to look at a map and really look at uh, like, like El Salvador and map that to Nicaragua, what people think of as populated Nicaragua really closely matches El Salvador in shape and size and population. And so Nicaragua, as they think of it, and traditional Nicaragua by border, is very much like El Salvador, maybe slightly larger, slightly misshapen, but the, the basics are still there. 
And so uh, if you're in this zone on the Pacific, you are in what I like to call traditional Nicaragua, where Nicaraguans, there's no, there's no dispute, right? This is uh, same in Panama. Panama City is Panama City in the Departamento of Panama in the country of Panama. When you're in Panama, if you're out west and say, I'm going to Panama, they know you mean Panama City. They know you're heading east into Panama. When you go west, they consider it something else, even though legally it's the country of Panama. Same thing here in Nicaragua. When you head east of this zone, Yes, technically you're in the country of Nicaragua, but you're not in Nicaragua anymore. You're not around Nicaraguans. You're not around Nicaraguan linguistically, historically, culturally, anything. It is the Mosquito Coast. It is an English-speaking Creole zone that has more in common with the Honduran uh, uh, Mosquito Coast or Jamaica than it does with Nicaragua. But its land is attached to Nicaragua, and so and it's a very, very lightly populated zone. And so the Mosquito Kingdom was split in two. The northern half is administered by Honduras. The southern half is administered by Nicaragua. And really, it's like the Basque country split between France and Spain. Yes, you're in France. Yes, you're in Spain. But Basque country is its own nation. And in Nicaragua, that's an autonomous two. It's split in half. It's two autonomous zones that govern themselves and operate very much outside of the realms of what you think think of as Nicaragua. When we talk about Nicaragua and its volcanoes, Nicaragua and its weather, its, its, its climactic, its activities, its food, its culture, its language, all those things, that is the western portion. And if you, if you come here, it doesn't take very much to really feel that and be like, ah, I see, no, it's very obvious where this is. Of course, it's open. You're welcome to go to the other zone. I'm not in any way suggesting you shouldn't. Just that be aware that this is why people pick one zone or the other. They are completely different places. If you were, uh, if you really like Nicaragua, for example, cost of living, physical location, um, politics, those kinds of things, but you wished you were in Belize physically, then the Nicaraguan Mosquito Coast would be the perfect answer for you. It's like a blend of the two, right? You get a lot of that culture and language and food and all that of Belize or Jamaica, while having uh, the the politic of of Nicaragua and access to Managua as your airport instead of Bomopan and uh, to you know Leon and Granada and stuff as your activity centers instead of having no big cities, whatever. And of course, much lower cost of living. Uh, on the East Coast, we also have the Corn Islands. These get rather expensive, not in the grand scheme of things, but for Nicaragua, they're outrageously expensive, very small and very difficult to get to. They're quite far out there, but these are full on Caribbean islands. Uh, so those are options as well. So you have the question, um, what's it like over there? I'm hoping I'm kind of describing it. Keep in mind, it is basically jungle going right up to the water. It's a very, very desolate zone and there are no major settlements on the East Coast. Um, uh, in the south, we have one. Um, Bluefields is, is a major settlement, but it's not like, it's not always considered a city. It's often considered a village, uh, pretty small. And the rest of the coast is basically without cities. Little tiny villages sprinkled along the coast and even tinier villages sprinkled inland over a huge area. It's going to feel almost more like you're heading out to the Amazon than to somewhere in the Caribbean, right? So be prepared that the, the between that Atlantic coast, that Caribbean coast, and settled Nicaragua is the world's second largest wide open jungle. So we're talking some seriously remote zones out there. Uh, so traveling to and from that takes a long time. So if you want to be remote, if you want that Caribbean stuck on a uh, Caribbean island of your own kind of feeling, there's a lot of coast out there that you could do something with. There's a lot of places where you could escape and there's some settlements that some of them are actually quite nice uh, that you can get to out there. So that is all an option. But if you're looking for the Nicaraguan experience, all the stuff we show, the cities, the food, the history, the culture, the, the language, all that, that only exists on the Pacific coast. So very, very different things. So did we ever consider the East Coast? Not really. We love Nicaragua as a cultural and linguistic location. We love uh, the connections to the neighboring countries. Those don't really exist on the other side. Uh, if you're going to the north from uh, the Mosquito Coast, you go into remote Mosquito Coast in Honduras. You're just out in this jungle that keeps going. Kind of the same thing if you're going into Costa Rica, but if you're over here in uh, Western Nicaragua, in Pacific Nicaragua, we are connected to El Salvador and populated Honduras and populated Costa Rica. Easy highways to get through everywhere, all kinds of resources, lots of cities to pick from, lots of activities. So um, I think you can, I think you can probably gather from that. Yes, the East Coast is absolutely accessible to you. Yes, it has some really cool, interesting things. 
um, but the gap in what you would experience is outrageously large. It is not like, ah, just two slightly different flavors of coastal Nicaragua. In no way whatsoever is that the case. It is two absolutely unique universes. Um, it's also worth noting, if you do have any concerns about things like hurricanes, that is the East Coast that gets that. The West Coast and the Pacific basically has no concerns about hurricanes and stuff. We get them, but it's mostly just heavy rain and ooh, it's a wet day. Right. Uh, all right. Next question. Hey, Scott, I see you take a lot of important factors into consideration when choosing a place to live. Thank you. I, I think I do. I also am from Texas and would be visiting home often, as we do. Uh, you mentioned Colombia and I believe Panama as good options, too. Can you tell me why you decided against those two countries as they are also on my list? Thank you for all your incredibly helpful insight. So I'm going to guess just from what your list is that you're looking for a warm place to live. Um, all of those are countries that either are warm or offer amazing warm options. Panama is just warm. They're like us here in Nicaragua. We are a warm location. Colombia is a much larger country and offers both quite warm uh, cities like Cali and Cartagena, uh, as well as cold, cold country, uh, cities like Bogota and Medellin. So I'm going to guess you're looking at the warm in all of these. If you were looking at uh, cooler temperatures, but still like this general region, which admittedly the whole flying home to Texas thing, like Columbia is kind of um, your last option for easy flights back to Texas. Um, uh, but, so we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But if you're looking at that easy flights to Texas zone and you want cool weather, you'd be looking primarily at Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and maybe Costa Rica. Costa Rica is in the middle, leaning towards warm, but it's a bit cooler than here in Panama. Uh, but Colombia will definitely get cool like Guatemala, but also warm like here in Nicaragua. Okay, so that's, I'm, I'm guessing at, at some of your stuff here uh, based on your list. Um, so first thing I wanna list for everybody, if you're looking at countries in this zone and you're from Texas and you're worried about those flights, you wanna be able to get home. You kind of have a few bands of access. Um, the farthest Southern city that you can consider and still have what I would consider reasonably simple access back to Texas or most of the Southern US, Miami, for example, is going to be Lima. So that gives you all the way down to Peru. That's a bit farther than Colombia. So you do have that, but Bolivia is off your radar for two reasons. They do not have direct flights. It's slightly farther. Those kind of go together. And as an American, which she is, you're looking at a much more difficult visa process, whereas most of the others are just open to you or basically open. Bolivia requires some approvals and paperwork in order to go. Certainly you can still visit Bolivia, but it is not the simple, I can just travel their location like these others. So Peru could be on your list, but doesn't seem like it's offering what it is you're looking for. Peru is very different than these others. Ecuador, uh, Guayaquil, in theory, large city, but only large city on the coast. Um, Ecuador does offer some potential options. So that, uh, I'm really guessing at what you're looking for, but it's possible that that's going to make sense for you. Colombia, lots of great options. Cartagena is pretty expensive. Um, so of the places that you're likely to look at um, in Panama and Colombia, a lot of them are a bit more expensive than here, for sure. Um, they're uh, much more developed or modernized countries. So they have a lot to offer. Uh, from a physical location, they are a bit farther away than Texas. So your flights are gonna be a little bit longer. Um, your cost of living is going to be a little bit higher. Colombia, just a little bit higher. Panama, a lot higher. So that's important. Panama is dramatically more expensive than Nicaragua. Nicaragua being the poorest country in Latin America, Panama being the richest. So while they do share some things and they're physically pretty close to each other, and I used to live in Panama, they are also very divergent in a lot of ways. If you're looking for modern high rises, uh, fancy restaurants, the urbane experience or the extended Florida coast, but with a Latin American flair, although Florida has a Latin American flair as well. I know someone's going to joke about that, um, but a very Latin American flair, uh, then Panama has that in spades. Does it also have some wilds and mountains and like beautiful, you know, uh, uh, islands? Is it? Yes. Yes, it does offer that, but in much smaller quantities and a very different feel. Panama is not part of Central America, not historically, not uh, culturally. It is part of South America in those ways, but kind of cut off. So it has a bit of independence and, and you feel it. It is in some ways the Dubai of Latin America. It's kind of neutral 
um, in a surprising number of ways that also makes it incredibly interesting. But unlike Dubai, uh, I think Panama still has a lot of neat history and culture on its own, whereas Dubai is pretty much the history of constructing the buildings in the desert. Um, so for Panama, um, I, I do have to say I love Panama, right? I lived there. It is fantastic. Panama City is one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, I absolutely adore the museum scene and the canal and watching the boats come and go. I love being able to sit out and, and see Panama City. I love the weather, the storms rolling in. I lived in Rio Ato, which is um, about an hour and a half west of the city along that extended coastline. That was fantastic, very remote. Um, and and just, just talking about it floods back beautiful memories of, of, of living there, uh, something that I really enjoyed. It was very magical. It was my first place that I ever lived in Latin America, and that's really important to me in a lot of ways. I would love to go back. I want to go spend a lot of time. Um, and, and luckily, it is now accessible, accessible to me by bus. Um, for me, if I was to choose living in Panama and taking a bus to visit Nicaragua or living in Nicaragua and taking the bus to visit Panama, I'm going to live in Nicaragua. One of the big driving factors for Nicaragua, of course, is that it's lower cost of living. You have more, way more choices. We have a population nearly double that of Panama. We have a lot more than double the land, I think, of Panama. Uh, so you have a lot to work with. You have a lot of cities to choose from that are, that are relatively interesting. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit sweaty. It's over 100 degrees in here today. Um, and you just have a lot you can work with uh, in Nicaragua. And so uh, I think that that gives it a lot of advantages. If what you're looking for, though, is that beautiful, developed, resorty uh, uh, coastline, or you're looking for that amazing built-up city, or you need a major international airport that will fly you anywhere you need to go, Panama, whew, right up to the top of your list. Panama's going to be fantastic for that. But if you want the lower cost of living, more easily accessible by land to other locations, um, more to do on the coast, more uh, traditional uh, lifestyles, then Nicaragua is going to win by a lot. So it really depends what you're looking for. Um, obviously, these are, these are fantastic locations. Colombia. So Colombia, uh, I've not been to, so that's, that's important. Uh, but Paul has, and I'm hoping to be in Colombia possibly this year. I'm going to be in South America almost certainly. That is on the books that I'm going to be there. Um, Colombia has a lot of the same culture as Panama because they, are, they were the same country not that long ago. Uh, they are connected by land. They are you know, obviously super close because they're connected. Um, Colombia is going to be another band distant from the United States by flights. Uh, it's going to be in the same group as Peru and Ecuador and Colombia. Those three are part of the northern flights of South America. So they're still reasonably easy to get to from the U.S., so well within your consideration. But they're the farthest points. Uh, flights down there are almost always going to have a layover, almost always going to be many hours. So you're looking at a pretty decent day of trying to get down there. Not a big deal, but it's, it's another band. Right, you're probably going to fly into either Mexico City or Panama City before flying into Colombia. So you're going to get to these locations, then go to those locations. If you don't mind that extra hop every time you want to come and go, no big deal. Colombia is going to be a little bit more expensive. It is a much, much, much larger country. So you have a lot more to potentially offer you in Colombia than you do in Panama or Nicaragua combined. Um, I mean, Colombia is a giant country with tons and tons of amazing cities and rural areas and jungle and wildlife and coasts and they have a giant Caribbean coast and a giant Pacific coast and just they just have a lot to offer from they have a big pool to offer things from so Colombia is really really neat the places you're most likely to consider in Colombia based on my guess that you're looking for hot locations are going to be Cartagena or Cali Cali is not that bad from a cost perspective it's also not as exciting kind of Pacific coast, not really on the water, pretty warm. Cartagena is the place you're most likely looking at, and it's known for being pretty expensive, at least within the northern Latin American zone. So you may be looking at um, quite a bit more cost. Uh, and your, your money's just not going to go as far. Um, but you're in Colombia, and you have a lot to explore without having to switch countries. That could be beneficial. I think all three of these make really good shortlist for someone looking for really warm Spanish-speaking locations. Um, that also said, all the places you're listing have cultural affinities and language affinities for each other. That would also rule out the Nicaraguan East Coast for you. Not rule out, but it would not fit into this pool. 
uh, whereas, whereas Panama, both coasts, but they're a north and south coast, not an east and west coast. It is Caribbean and Pacific, but on completely different angles. Uh, sort of the same for uh, Colombia with a north and west coast. All right, the camera overheated twice while making this video. We're going to get through it. That's, it's 100 degrees for real here today. So even in my office, recording videos is crazy hard. At least now I have something cool to help me out. So the last point there is um, I think the biggest factor other than potentially financial and potentially the travel time back to Texas. Um, of those, Panama is probably the most convenient for the most flights. I need to point that out. Nicaragua is close, but the number of airlines that you have options with is relatively low. Panama is farther away, but not that much farther away, and the number of airlines is much higher. Colombia is going to drop the number of airlines and be farther away. So Panama is probably the winner there, but it's a pretty close second for Nicaragua because it is so close. Miami is just two hours and five minutes on the right flight, uh, and at some times there are direct flights to Texas. She didn't say which city in Texas she's in, so that varies things a little bit. Remember that uh, Nicaragua also has great flights to Texas via Liberia in Costa Rica when you need those too. So that's another small bonus, but of course Panama, depending on where you are, is not that far from uh, Costa Rica if you need to use those airports too, but it is farther than almost all of Nicaragua. All right, last question. Hey Scott, this is still Jerry. She had three questions in a row. I'm brand new to my research phase and your videos are a great resource. I just emphasize that there. Thank you. I would let, and thank you. Uh, I would like to purchase a small, maybe two bedroom home on or very near a beach. Nicaragua is definitely the place for that. I do not want to be surrounded by expats. Also, Nicaragua is the place for that. I want to experience the culture. Is there an area you would recommend? My, my friend's mother recently purchased a house directly on Playa Gigante waterfront for 20,000 US, I presume. It needed work and she has invested another 60,000 into renovating it and adding three apartments above it for vacation rentals. So just to be clear, this is a total investment, it sounds like for 80,000 US dollars on Playa Gigante, which is a very nice beach. Uh, uh, that you're looking at a, th a home, probably probably small, um, and three rental apartments uh, in the building. That's that's pretty cool when you start saying that's what $80,000 will get you. Um, I'd love to get a tour of that and show what $80,000 produced, right? Let her know, Jerry, that we'd love to uh, show up and uh, and do that. Like, that would be, that would be really cool. Um, and we have not put Playa Gigante on the show at all, ever. Um, so that would be another uh, fun thing to show people. Um, for sure, let me, um, I want to make sure I'm getting my information correct on Gigante because it's not an area that I know super, super well. Uh, Gigante is roughly the first major beach south of Popoyo. So this is part of the, the core Rivas zone. I'm going to talk about this. So, so her question, um, I'd be, I would consider a project like this. I'm curious about your take on the different beach areas. Thank you in advance. Okay, so the reason I'm going to talk about this is because this is relevant to her question. So Playa Gigante is part of the Rivas Beach system. And Nicaragua, very roughly, can be divided into the northern beaches, those north of Rivas, and the southern beaches, those in Rivas. And the reason that it kind of divides up this way is that Rivas, while not the biggest or most populated departamento, does have the most waterfront. Um, it also is directly bordered exactly when you hit the Rivas border with Carrasso, there is the, um, uh, the refuge, the, the, I don't even know its full name, but it's the, the forest refuge and it's quite a large area. And so there are no beaches. I mean, there are, but you can't go there. Uh, so the northern beaches start in Carrasso and go north of the refuge and Rivas simply has all of Rivas for it. So Nicaragua has far more land in the non-Rivas zone, but Rivas is known for its beaches. Um, it's, it's a beach-focused area. It is um, the most likely area for expats. El Estillero is the beach in the north, but Popoyo is the one everyone knows. It is one of the big ones. Uh, some of the beaches that people know, Gigante, Manzanillo, San Lorenzo, La Paqueta, San Juan del Sur, uh, Sucio, uh, Coco, La Flor, Astiano, um, all of those, uh, they're all beautiful beaches. There's a lot, and there's a ton I didn't mention. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of Rivas. Rivas is basically just a long stretch of beaches, both on the Pacific side and on the lake side. Uh, so there's just, there's just a lot of interest. And the city of Rivas is basically on the, the lake coast. So uh, what you're gonna get in Rivas in general, this is very general, is you get a very rural area. Uh, Rivas is, for the most part, empty, and even its one city, Rivas itself, 
is not a very big city. So this entire zone is very low on population. So you get people who are very spread out. Um, and it is also very low on the radar of Nicaraguans because it is very far from everything, right? It's cut off by distance and it is cut off by uh, the, the refuge. And so because of this, it is primarily attached to Costa Rica and it is the entirety of Rivas, uh, on the coast at least, has a certain propensity towards being an expat zone. Uh, San Juan del Sur itself is the enclave um, much of Rivas is a mix of things, but all of it is famous for its uh, private um, construction. It's uh, big companies from the north come in and, and build communities there. It is full of tiny enclaves. Um, it is expat central across the entire coastal region of Rivas. Popoyo, uh, Higate, all of those are going to have very large percentages of expats. Um, they're also very popular for people who are looking for getaway expat vacation zones. So if you're looking to do rentals and that kind of stuff, it can be a great zone. Just be aware that it has a Rivas as a zone has a very strong feel that leans towards expats and surfers. Um, it is almost a large collection of enclaves. Those enclaves vary from very organized like San Juan del Sur to very disorganized but corporate like you'll find in, in some of the, especially north of San Juan del Sur to much like just backpackers camping on the beach but still expat backpackers who are who are visiting. You're, you're going to get a very low percentage of Nicaraguans anywhere in Rivas. But that said, Rivas has a lot of beaches and a lot of cool stuff to offer. So um, for sure, you could find some great stuff all through there, Popoyo being one of the most popular. As you go north, you hit what we call the real Nicaraguan beaches. These are the ones that people who live in Nicaragua, who grew up in Nicaragua, generally think of as their beaches. Uh, of course, they still go to San Juan del Sur. It's cool for them like it is for expats, but they really think of it as a world apart, and it is. Starting at Huehuete uh, and Tupelapa uh, in, in southern uh, uh, Carrasco, you start getting into the, the real Nicaraguan beaches. This is a completely different feel than you're gonna get in Rivas. Uh, these are uh, nearly no expats, uh, even in La Boquita. These are, these are expat free zones. Um, if you're going to live there, you will be living with locals. I do like this area for the most part, uh, like Huehuete, Bocana, Casares, La Boquita. Um, I almost uh, bought a hotel there a couple of years ago. Uh, what I like about it is that it's um, <clears throat> very remote, so you're you're definitely getting a little bit of that remote like Rivas kind of feel, but you're not that remote, and you do have a decently easy access to Didiambra, which is a small but really cool city, and from there you have decent access into Managua. So if you did need to go places, you're not completely isolated from really nice. Like you want to be able to go out for fancy dinners. You want to be able to go out and go shopping. You can get to those places without too much of an effort. Um, but when you're on the beaches, you feel like you're pretty, pretty remote. As we move up towards, so that's Carrasco, and there's a few other things. Uh, in Managua, each of these departmentos has their own beach zone. Managua starts with its primary beaches of Pochamil, Masachapa, and uh, Monte Limar. Uh, also, Costa Azul, uh, Mar Marabella is up there. Uh, there's a few things, but those, Pochamil and Masachapa are the main ones. Those are the Managua beaches. And my first hotel that I bought was in Pochamil. Um, I actually bought the Hotel Pochamil. Uh, and then there's a long story we'll go into sometime. They tried to take advantage of us and we managed to get out of that deal. Or they actually accidentally released us from the deal. We knew we were being taken advantage of and were able to run away. So we got lucky, but it's a, another beautiful area that is really devoid of tourists. Tourist expats, they do not go to Pochamil uh, a tiny bit to Massachapa, but Pochamil, like, not at all. Like, a very, very uh, Nicaraguan, but pretty busy beaches. So, interesting opportunities there. Those have the advantage of connecting directly through El Crucero into Managua. So, their travel time into the capital, not very long at all. I mean, you're still looking at over an hour, but it's not bad. That is their associated city. There's a few other places as you go up, like Grand Pacifica is an enclave in that zone. Some people like that, so that's that's there. As you move north, you hit the Leon beaches, and the Leon beaches are separated into two zones because we have a refuge in the middle as well. Southern Leon starts at Transido, El Transido. That is 
um, the big beach in Southern Leon. Um, very popular, very hard to reach. Dirt roads that will be changed at some point, but for now it still has terrible dirt roads to get to. Uh, we know a lot of people who like to go down there. It is a really nice surf spot. It's one of the big surf spots of the country. Um, Playa Hermosa is along there, uh, Valero, Miramar, um, and then at the northern end of that zone is Puerto Sandino. There's a highway that runs along, a highway, it is a dirt road, but it's a little bit larger dirt road that runs through there. And so really the, the ones that people really know is Puerto Sandino, Playa Hermosa, and El Transito. Um, those are pretty remote. Uh, Sandino does have a little bit of stuff, Transito does have a little bit of stuff, and Hermosa is in the middle and anything that isn't one of those, there's beaches all along there. If you want remote, but you're still in the kind of Leon area, you're technically in the Departamento, they're there. Um, you're, if, if they, when they get the paved road in, that's gonna become much nicer. It's worth noting that while they're in Leon, Leon has major secondary cities, La Paz Centro and Nagarote. These beaches really are associated with Nagarote, not with Leon proper. So they're Departamento Leon, not City Leon. You go a little bit farther, but the road does not go through, and you get La Paz Centro's local uh, uh, beach area, which is Salinas Grandes, named for the big salt flats there. That is the southern point of the Nature Reserve Juan Venado. Uh, so then you have an area where you cannot have any uh, buildup on the beaches, and then you get the Leon City proper beaches of Las Manitas, where I live, and Ponoloya. These are the second biggest beach zone in the country. Um, because Leon is the largest city near a beach and, and the closest that any city is to the beach, uh, they get quite a, an interesting um, uh, culture that grows up there. So Potaloya and Las Benitas together, a uh, huge beach zone, nowhere close to San Juan del Sur, but much bigger, much more uh, built up than anything else you will find anywhere else in Nicaragua. Uh, and their travel time into the big city of Leon, 300,000 people, second largest city in the country, is as little as like 15 minutes, depending on where you live on the beach. Uh, and it's walkable. I've done it in uh, four hours, under four hours from the beach. I put all the length of the beach uh, in that. So a normal person, if your foot's not broken, you could walk that in as little as two and a half hours. That's long, but that's not so bad for the major city to be near a beach. So those are really unique. The northernmost departmento in Nicaragua is Chinandega, well, along the water anyway. And Chinandega also is a pretty major city, but not nearly as big as Leon, and really near the water, but not as near as Leon. Uh, and it has uh, the Porto Corinto is located in its highway coming in from the city. And what's important about Corinto is that this is the deep water port for the Pacific side of Nicaragua, and there currently is none on the Caribbean. They're building one. We don't have one currently. So Corinto is super important. This is the one spot where we're, we're able to take really large container ships for the country. So this is a nearly a city on the water. So it's much bigger than Las Benitas and Ponoloya, but it's much less of a beach community. It's much more of a logistics hub. So this is, you can get cruise ships there, you can get yachts there, but really you're getting container ships. So it's an important spot, but it's, you know, traffic in town is not tourist, it's tractor trailers. Right, but it is interesting. I have done videos on it. I do like Corinto, like it's got potential, but it's probably not a place you'd want to invest like that. But you may discover that you like just how non-touristy, but, but lively it is just because it has all these blue collar logistics workers, truckers and, and longshoremen and stuff. They all live there. So that's interesting. And it does have pretty easy access to Chinandega, which while super hot and has no tourists, is actually a quite nice city. Uh, so if you wanted to get to the fancy restaurants in the city, it is a rich city. So it's got really nice restaurants, good shopping, that kind of stuff. And then of course, if you go into Chinandega, it's easy to then hop on the highway to Leon. You're really not that far. You have a number of really tiny beaches as you go north from there uh, for quite some distance until you get to the beaches of El Viejo, which is Chinandega's second city. Um, those are mostly really far north and pretty small. The one of note is um, Hikilio. Hikilio. It's very hard for me to pronounce. Um, I would need someone to say it right before I said it to have a hope of getting it. Uh, and that is um, an up and coming beach, very far north, very far west. Uh, but people are saying it has a lot of potential. It's the, it's the next of the Las Panitas type beaches in development. As you go north of there, there are a few isolated places where you can potentially build uh, on, the, on the fronts, but 
uh, pretty much anywhere else that you're going outside of those that I mentioned, you're really looking at tiny little fishing communities clinging to the edge of the of the continent, and um, you're not going to have any infrastructure uh, currently. That doesn't mean that you couldn't introduce that. It's not that you wouldn't have an opportunity uh, to potentially do something really interesting. And of course, costs will be much lower to purchase in those places. If you're thinking eighty thousand, or I'm sorry, twenty thousand to purchase land near the water, um, I guess that was it was actually a house for twenty thousand. So that's even though it's a fixer-upper, that sounds like a pretty pretty good deal that you got there. Um, in Las Panitas, I know a three-bedroom that is ready to move in. Not fancy in any way, and it's not on the water, but it is only one building off the water. I guess it's two buildings off the water, but it's like 50 meters from the sand. 35000 is what they're asking. We're assuming it would sell in the 20s. Uh, so 20 but needing a bit of work um, actually on the waterfront. I, I think she got a good deal with, you know, obviously not seeing it. Um, but that same kind of thing in these, that might be 10,000, 12,000 uh, in, in a lot of these other areas, if you could find something similar. Um, but building your own thing, doing your own thing, there's a lot of coast where you could do that. Biggest considerations is, are you going to have good paved roads today? Or are you going to have them in the future? That's going to affect whether, whether you want to keep coming and going to your house, whether other people are going to want to come and go to your house. That stuff will matter a lot. Um, I think that if you're looking at those kinds of numbers, 20,000 for something that needs a lot of work, 80,000 total, maybe 100,000, that's kind of your envelope. I'm, I'm totally making up numbers for you now. Um, but if you were looking at those kinds of numbers, I think you have a tremendous amount, not San Juan del Sur probably, but the rest of the country, almost all of it is open to you within that price range. You might need to shop around a little bit. You maybe need to look for a deal and not just go for the first thing you find. But I think you have a lot of options and the market is really, really ripe for this right now. Uh, the beach traffic is still low. Places are still going out of businesses on uh, out of business on the beaches all the time. The largest club and hotel in Las Panitas didn't open for the biggest weekend of the year. We need to have a separate video about that. Uh, that's a big one. We don't know why. We haven't heard. Uh, but that is a huge deal. The, they they've been closed for years, but they've always opened up for Semana Santa. This year they didn't. It shows just how much the beach is continuing to collapse, even as people are saying, "Ah, oh, tourism is back. Things are great." It's there's still a lot of failure happening. And, uh, and people are still giving up actively on, on some of the best, most developed properties. Uh, so that's, um, that's still a big deal. Um, and that's, that's pretty much your options for realistic beaches inside Nicaragua. Um, I would recommend doing what Paul and I did in 2019. Come down, rent a car, find someone who wants to drive you around, hire me to drive you around. I would, I would be happy to do that. Um, obviously, I do need to be paid. That is what my company does for services. Um, but we would love to do something like that, like start and just drive every, you know, every few hours, go to another beach, explore, um, you know, spend a few days going up and down the coast, evaluating every single beach, take lots of pictures, look at available properties, talk to people locally um, and get a feel for um, what you like. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing is that you have a lot of options and there's some that I can give you really clear guidance on really quickly. Corinto is going to be very different. San Juan del Sur, very different. Las Pinitas, very different. And then you have a number that have a lot of similarity. The Pocha Meals, the Hui Hui Galpas, uh, I'm sorry, Puehuetes, um, Aposentillo, Hikelio, like all those, they're going to have a lot in common. And then it's going to be where do you find a deal or how, which city do you want to be associated with? So that's also going to be important. Do you want to be in the Rivas zone? the Managua zone, the Didiambra zone, which is Carrasso, um, the Southern Leon, the Northern Leon, the Chinandega or the El Viejo of Chinandega. Those are basically your breakdowns. And um, each one means that when you go to the grocery store, which community you're gonna go to. When you wanna go to a bar in the city, which one are you gonna go to? Uh, that matters a lot, right? Everybody in Rivas is converging on the city of Rivas and not very often, they tend to avoid it. Um, they may go to Managua as often as they go to Rivas because Rivas has so little to offer. Not that Rivas isn't a great city, it's nice. Um, but a lot of people, it's too small. When they want to go somewhere, they're going to Managua. But when you're up in the north, Chinandega and Leon have everything you need. You don't go to Managua that often. Um, a completely different lifestyle experience. And of course, if you're in the Managua zone, you just go to Managua, but it's really close. It's not a, it's not a far drive, so you don't worry about it. Um, so I think I, 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 that's kind of my take on the beaches. I think a lot of them have a lot to offer, um, and it, it's this mixture of how many expats do you want? Zero, a few, a lot, total. Um, you said very few, so I, I'm trying to gauge on that. Um, do you want little tiny village, fishing village, shipping port, remote, in the middle of things, near a city, far from a city, which city? 
those things are going to play the biggest role along with what spot you find. But really, if, let's say you have a budget of 80000 you have the option to do anything from buying a house that's ready to go to buying land and building completely and anything in between. So you really have a lot of flexibility at the price point that you're at, if that's the price point you're talking about. Be aware. Investment properties in Nicaragua are very difficult right now. Um, they have potential in the future, but the market, for the most part, those places keep closing, not opening. Um, so if you're looking at an investment, I warn people about this all the time, this is a tough time to invest in Nicaragua. If you're like me and you're here because you love it and any investment is just because you want to help the community or build something for the future, great. But if you're coming and you think you're going to live off of that, be really, really wary. Um, it, it is great if you have a house that you live in and you're able to rent out a couple extra rooms to just assist from time to time with your, with your expenses, excellent as long as you're not looking at that as your income. If you need that to be your income, that's gonna be a much more difficult conversation as far as what types of places you have, the property, the location that you have, which beaches you're on, of how you're gonna advertise it and keep the flow of people going to make enough to pay for, whether it's for you to live or to offset whatever it needs to offset, uh, could be a lot more difficult. But I think that model is one of the most likely to be successful here where it's simply your house. You're already living in it. You don't need an extra space. You're not maintaining something at any distance. That gives you at least some decent chance of having something that is probably not going to generate enough for you to live on, but may generate enough to seriously offset many of your other expenses that it may be uh, beneficial to do so if you like having people in your house, which a lot of people do. I would. So... I totally understand. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you've got questions like these, get in and ask them. Jerry did an awesome job. I love having this kind of stuff to answer because I can dig in and really provide some value. And I'm always looking for like, what's my next topic going to be? So stuff like this is fantastic. Um, I really like it. And uh, I hope it's really useful for you guys because um, this is stuff that I spend all my time thinking about. And we offer services. Just a reminder, info at relocatenicaragua.com. Um, whether you're looking for us to just go take some pictures of a house or whatever for you, or you're looking for something like this where we could spend a week and take you with a local and myself and drive all over the coast uh, and explore many different communities, stay in hotels, eat lots of different food, talk to people, look at properties, get a feel for what could be done, talk about business, all that you know, um, is available as well. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Share on social media. If you'd like to support the channel, other than hiring us, of course, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And I will see all of you tomorrow.